So welcome back to another episode of Mess Industry Conversations. We're very fortunate to be joined by Ty Hollingsby from GHD. GHD is one of the world's leading professional service companies. It's based in Australia, but works all over the world on lots of different exciting projects. And Ty is the National Building Engineering Leader at GHD. So welcome, Ty. Thank you. Um, so maybe start by introducing yourself um, and detail a little bit about what you do in your current role at GHD. Um, and also for the audience members who don't already know, maybe also explain a bit about sort of who GHD are and what they do. So yes, my, so my name is uh, Ty Hollingsby. I'm a mechanical engineer and that's the degree that I did uh, when I was at university, which is over 20 years ago now. And my role at GHD is the national building engineering leader for Australia. Um, and that role encompasses all associated engineering services needed to deliver building projects um, in predominantly in Australia, but we also work closely with uh, organization and partners in, in New Zealand. In the 20 years of my sort of experience in the building engineering space, I've worked through you know, a range of different kind of roles and, uh, and also a varying uh, array of responsibilities, both at project level and at uh, operational level. But my mechanical engineering degree has uh, enabled me to work across sort of a, a number of different disciplines within the building engineering space. One of them being around sustainability and uh, energy efficiency in buildings and objects in the built environment, as well as the more detailed sort of mechanical engineering scope and services, which encompass aspects of buildings like the air conditioning, ventilation systems, uh, the systems that enable uh, heating and cooling to uh, to occur in, in buildings, and, and also at a, at a much wider sort of city scale, district scale uh, use, which has been uh, both interesting and, and, and rewarding uh, at the same time over my career. And my role within, within GHD is, encompasses and, and involves uh, somewhere in the order of three to 400 uh, engineers spread across the, um, the Australian, all the Australian states. And we work across a, a range of, sort of building typologies or project typologies, which uh, encompass buildings and projects associated with uh, defence, so the Department of Defence in Australia, industrial facilities, education and science facilities like uh, university buildings and university campuses, as well as schools, secondary and primary. Transport market as well, so buildings associated with big transport projects like rail or airports. <coughs> uh, and then also uh, health and well-being, so uh, hospitals, medical facilities, places of respite. Those, those are the kind of projects or the typologies that uh, GHD as a buildings business uh, works in. Uh, GHD in itself is, is a very large organization, somewhere in the order of nearly 10,000 people spread around uh, Australia, New Zealand, uh, North America, uh, and, and in the US, uh, and also in, in the Philippines and, and some of the Pacific Islands as well. GHD as a business uh, uh, covers five key sectors, as it were. The first one being uh, what we call property and buildings, which is the sector that I that I work in, and which is associated with you know everything to do with buildings and property uh, related uh, projects. Um, there's energy and resources. And there's water. Um, there's environment, and then there's also the transport sectors. So the ten thousand people that we have in your organisation is spread across those five sectors, and we we work um, at all sort of resolutions of detail from early conceptual, quite simplified uh, approaches to those, those kind of projects in those sectors to very detailed uh, construction documentation and design to deliver complex projects. So you know, rail projects, uh, dams, uh, waterways, uh, reservoirs to uh, complex schools, uh, commercial uh, office uh, developments to a range of others. So it's, it's, it's really quite uh, wide ranging. And that probably answers the first bit of your question. Given that most people that will be tuning in are currently at university, maybe tell us a bit about your university experience, if you, if you don't mind. And is there, uh, anything, <laughs> is there anything you wish you'd done at university, sort of looking back on the experience? Kind of as a way of giving some advice just to the groups of people that are preparing themselves for their like, early careers. Yeah. So 
Yeah, it's, would we, you know, if I were to give myself advice from 20 odd years ago, your question was what are the something that I wish I did is probably, is probably in all honesty, go to a few more lectures. Uh, <laughs> I, I probably had a little bit too much fun at university on reflection. However, I see that as a really important aspect of your sort of life development and it gave, gave me a lot of context about why am I learning second order derivatives and Bernoulli's equation of heart? You know, what is, what, is, what is the point of all that? I would probably say the thing I really tried hard to do when I was at university was get some real life context as to why on earth I'm learning this stuff in engineering um, and how it might be useful to me later in life. I think when I was in the midst of being a student in university, having a good time, trying to learn you know, new, new things, the, the aspect that was not really emphasized for me was um, providing some real life context about what I'm learning. So I would say where you have the opportunity to either speak with people in industry or actively engage with engineers and then other people who are associated with that degree who are actually working and get into conversations with them to say, how, how does a second order differential equation affect you in your, in, your, in your daily work life? What are some of these things that you're learning in thermal dynamics or in fluid dynamics or in mathematics, mathematics four, for example? How do you apply that learning in a real life context? Providing that level of context makes, makes learning the theory really uh, central and in sort of in the middle of your head because uh, it sticks and it'll stick forever. So I've found um, when I have used that sort of thinking in the days of having a good time at university and learning thermal dynamics, you know, asking those really those key questions have has stuck with me for my whole career. So, you know, it it is um it sort of sort of burnt into my head the reasons why we've learned all this mathematics and all this theory, and it and it helps helps me in in daily work life because it it uh it's it's just there and and I know why why these equations work in the way they do. Uh, and it helps me get through my work quicker. And also at, at sort of, you know, after 20 odd years of working through this, it also helps explain to other people, uh, particularly more junior members of the team and, and helping them to learn, learn the trade and enabling them to do work on, on real life projects. That's probably a handful of sort of advice I would give uh, anyone currently in, in, in the faculty and in the world of engineering. And it's the same advice that I would give to myself to be very honest. In terms of the building engineering sector, we've sort of had different industry representatives from um, different sectors. So in terms of the building engineering sector specifically, what can a young engineer expect to do in the field? Like where can it take them? Where can it take you? Well, um, I'd say it could take you, it could take you almost anywhere. Um, I have I have commented often about this, like engineering as a um, I don't know if you want to call it a language, and uh, building engineering specifically as a language is 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 sort of cross cultural, and it, and once you become fluent in it, you find that you can talk that language in any sort of part of the industry, and so where it could take you is is, is literally anywhere in the world where there's where there's urban development and urban infrastructure. You know, I've I've had the the pleasure, the luckiness to work in in nearly all the continents around the world, with the exception of North and South, in the extreme in extreme colds. You can, you, you can work in engineering and building engineering in, in these different countries on these different types of projects, different scales of projects, but using the same core competency that you would learn uh, in an engineering degree at, at university. And there's, you know, with the exception of language, you know, speaking the language in the country that you're in, you're actually able to, to work across the languages because the mathematics is just so the mathematics and the engineering is a single language that can be shared by, by all. It, it's, a, it's a really quite an amazing platform that lets you travel the world and, and traverse the sort of different standards and uh, regulations uh, that, that might exist in those countries. And you will be able to work on projects in, in all parts of the world without having to try very hard. Right? You don't need to retrain. You don't need to relearn many aspects of what you might pick up at engineering, for example. So that's where it could take you. Um, but if you know if, if the global uh, aspirations or, or wishes is not part of your sort of portfolio of desires, and you and you were to you and you wanted to stay here, for example, in Australia or in New Zealand, it could it could take you uh, to 
in a similar way to exposure to a, a range of project sizes, you know, from enormous buildings to very small buildings in different sectors of, of the market. You know, like, like what I said, you know, hotels, for example, residential developments to university to laboratory facilities to super secret data centers to government type facilities. You know, the, the, the degree enables you to, to, to be across all those kind of, uh, but it also, within building engineering itself, you know, you, you can um, extend into different sort of components in building engineering as it were. So, you know, you have mechanical engineering as a discipline, you have electrical engineering as a discipline, um, hydraulics, which is associated with you know, flowing of water through pipes and sewage and, and, and drainage, to have fire uh, engineering, to acoustic engineering, to material engineering, to fire safety, and you know, all there's a range of disciplines that you could actually get into on the basis of your engineering degree. That's that's one of the magics, I think, of, of doing engineering is to you know, open up the market to, to you as long as you're good and pay attention and go to your lectures. Another question we had was maybe you could tell us a little bit about an interesting project that you've worked on previously. Yeah, um, well, I've had, I think I've, I've uh, been involved in uh, lots of interesting projects, uh, which is probably why I'm still working as an engineer. So I, I find, let's say, okay, so I'm, I'm from Hong Kong originally, um, and that's, that's where I was born, that's where I went to school. Um, then I left Hong Kong to, um, go uh, do my degree in, in, in London in the UK. And then after that, I then spent a lot of time working in, in the UK and parts of Asia. And then eventually I got an opportunity to um, work on a project back in Hong Kong. And that was for a new school that was being developed for the market over there in, in, in Hong Kong. It was a large school in a very beautiful part of Hong Kong, away from all the concrete city. And this was a particularly sort of interesting and appropriate project for me because it was it was like um, it was like I, I left my home in Hong Kong, flew away from the nest, and had all this experience, developed my sort of core competency in my professional life to a level where then I could bring it back to Hong Kong and help put something back into the community there. And, and put and what we were putting back into that community was a very large, vertical, uh, super green, highly efficient school for for the secondary education market over there. And the ambitions for that school was to be the greenest, most sustainable school uh, in Hong Kong, and also to be a bit of a, a, a flag flyer for that region about how, how you can approach um, teaching. And they utilized like a, a range of new and different pedagogy uh, to provide secondary learning in, in Hong Kong. That was super interesting and, and sort of personal to me because I went to school there. So I had to really understand a really broad context of what it's like being there. But what was really sort of cool was being able to take um, new technology and uh, new approaches to buildings into, into Hong Kong and then incorporate that into a new school that, that I knew was going to be you know, super efficient and very good to run and comfortable and also a wonderful learning environment for something like 500 kids at that school of there. And for me, that was um, uh, a really good project that, that demonstrated how you know, like an engineering degree could take you around the world. You pick up all this new knowledge and then experience, and then you can bring it back to where you come from and then create something that the community really likes. Um, the project won a, a load of awards for it and it just felt really good. It was a really good high um, feel good factor on that project. That's, that's one example, for example, of a, yeah. something that I thought was good. Another, maybe a harder question. I think a lot of the challenges that we face at university and a cyber that the lecturer puts up, it's really hard, for example, but challenges you face in industry, I'm sure, are very different to that. So what's an interesting challenge that you've faced in a project that might help the cohort understand a bit more about the critical role that engineers play like within a project or within an organisation? Yeah, there's probably, um, wow, there's a, there's, uh, oh, there's, a, there's a multitude of little snippets of um, importance that the role the, the engineer has on the project. Maybe I can provide a collection of examples. So there's a project that we worked on in Vietnam with the United Nations. And this was a, uh, another fantastic project where the United Nations under a program called One UN was looking to consolidate a number of different agencies into a single building. And in Vietnam, in Hanoi, we helped them design and, and build their first integrated agency building 
which was a refurbishment of a, an old apartment building into a new uh, super green, nearly zero energy headquarters for the United Nations in, in Vietnam. And it was looking at using the, uh, what is equivalent to the green star or the green, a green building uh, rating system. Um, but this was gonna be the first one that was gonna be developed specifically in Vietnam. It was also the United Nations first public and very uh, committed uh, endeavor into demonstrating how the um, sustainable development goals can be manifested in physical asset and specifically for the United Nations and, and, and an office building. So there was a, a very, very wide range of global aspirations and also a wide range of internal sort of requirements and, and performance needs around sustainability that needed to be incorporated into the building. In amongst all of this is sort of rational and pragmatic science-based uh, decision-making that needs to happen because you only have so much amount of money to do and meet the aspirations and needs of, of, of the project. And so as an engineer, like one of the, one of the key skill sets that you have is, is providing that frame of reference to understand context about uh, what, what, a technology, what a technological or an engineering approach might cost and also the ongoing uh, financial cost to the client and being able to demonstrate what is really worth doing. So how much investment do you put in and what is your uh, return on that investment, both in terms of monetary re return, but also carbon emissions, energy performance, energy outcomes, and community outcomes, who benefits from your intervention in a building. And it, it really takes an engineer to, in my view, uh, a good engineer to, to understand that wide range of different criteria and conduct analysis um, and simulations and calculations to demonstrate to the client um, and, the pro and the wider project team, you know, what is the best approach that we can take here? What is the best way we can spend our money to get to the outcome that the project or the client really wants? <clears throat> so that kind of return on investment sort of analysis, but at a much wider and broader uh, viewpoint, are uh, skill sets and um, experiences that in engineering gives you and it en enables you to be right in front of the client in this case in the united nations and then the, the respective uh, people who are you know, representing those agencies to have direct conversations with them that are really clear effective um, but also very uh, very clearly articulated as to why we're doing the things that we're doing and it helps progress the project in a much more efficient manner some people within the industry are saying that the role of engineers is changing from purely technical roles to something else. What's your take on this? And as another question, what does the engineer of the future look like? Hmm. Right, so the, first, so the first question is the, um, the changing role of the engineer moving from what was originally maybe entirely a technically based artisanship might be the right word to use where it's around the technicalities where it's moving um, and this is a consistent movement and it might be even accelerating is that engineering certainly in the consultancy space is just as much about that practice of, of consultancy with customers with clients so what i mean by that is you may be excellent at technical stuff but if you're unable to communicate with the client either to demonstrate the value of what you're doing or helping to explain or sell what you're doing to a customer or a client, you, you won't have any business and you will not be able to succeed in the marketplace. Because aspects of the technical components of engineering are being commoditized actually is, is the right word. And commodita commoditization of engineering is partly around you know, software and, and, and tools being able to do a lot of the work automatically that previously would have taken an engineer or someone similar quite many hours to produce or simulate something in a spreadsheet or in a simple MATLAB, you know, program or something, something like that. A lot of that automated sort of also that manual processing of producing technical calculations is now automated and automated at a level where it is, it is super quick to do a lot of really complex work. And so as a result of that, the technical services that you provide to the market 
it's less around sort of the time it takes to do stuff and you're not really pricing or selling that sort of time-based unit as much. And what you're, what you're really selling is uh, the service and the value that you're bringing to, to a project. So value might be a nebulous term, but in fact, it is a nebulous term. What on earth does it mean? And so in project speak and also building speak, it's about, for example, you having the technical ability to do design work so that you can optimize, let's say, the building structure or the building fabric to give the client another floor on a 30 story building because you're so smart that you've worked out how you can optimize the structure when with the same construction budget you can add another floor to the building by shrinking the structure and making the flat the slabs thinner that provides a lot of money back to the client but they're they're paying for the same fee and that's your service offering to them you're adding adding providing value <clears throat> and it's using those technical sort of skills and and automation tools to help you get to that point. If you're unable to work in that manner in the current market, and as it moves faster and faster, you, 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 just will, you will be priced out of the, of the competition uh, and, you, and also the customer or the client won't, won't come to you for those kind of roles. So the ability to be on top of technological development with software and tools that help save time and also help optimize design, the design process. As an engineer, you need, you need to be across all that now not just the, the sort of the hardcore equations or the, or the thermodynamics um, that, that you, you're learning at, at university. You have to be, you have to be, have a lot wider soft skills as it were, you know, talking to the client, consulting, uh, you know, working out a way of providing scenarios and options and, and, and helping other people, other clients, customers make decisions based on your very, so it needs to be useful advice to them.